Rise and shine and spring to attention, mainspring, that is. Waking up with watches and what a spread. For those of you joining me, remember everything on the table is in stock. If you're watching this morning of, just give a call to my friends Brian Govberg, George Mayer, Jason Main at the company and they can help you with pricing, availability, extra pictures and accessories for everything you see here. I have watches that are not listed on the site. I just want to be clear about that because I always get the questions. Jumping straight into today's show, I want to remind you that we're giving away a Panerai Luminor PAM 523. Click the link in the description to enter, but the opposite of a Panerai would be the Bulgari Octo Finissimo Automatic. Launched in 2017, this was the latest in what was then a mounting series of impressive Bulgari Octo Finissimo launches, including the Minute Repeater, the Tourbillon, and previously the Manual Wind Watch, but it was with the Automatic, a GPHG laureate for that year, that Bulgari truly broke through as a manufacturer designing and building its watches, not merely as a collection of impressive parts purchased separately, but as a full integrated manufacturer. Now the watch they launched was at the time the world's thinnest automatic and it remains ethereal and otherworldly, wearing like a second skin and so light and easy to wear in titanium that you almost feel as though it's missing, shooting furtive glances at your wrist just to make sure it's still there. 5.15 millimeters rated, but I've measured them at five millimeters on the nose. It's nominally a 40 millimeter watch and I have to say that it wears as a 40 by 40 rectangular, or I should say square case. The 40 by 40 square case is effectively the platform size of the case itself. As you'll note, the bracelet, unlike so many integrated bracelet designs, effectively pulls straight down and around the wrist. So this one wears as a true 40 by 40 square. Now the timepiece is very slender and you can see why. The micro rotor automatic movement caliper BVL138 is only 2.23 millimeters thick. And you can see that the movement over 36 millimeters in diameter is sized to suit the shape and the size of this case as it pushes right up to the edge of the platform of the Octo Finissimo Auto. Now turning it over you can see that the finishing standards are quite high. Valet de Jeu watch finishing at its best. This is the manufacturer that previously was Gerald Genta and Daniel Rott and that's why I say Bulgari is more than an assembly of impressive parts. It now feels like manufactured Bulgari and you get that in the mirrored anglage at the edge of the bridges. In the gradient Cote de Genève, as you can see that is true, abrasive wheels Cote de Genève, not the stamped kind because of the gradient from light to dark on one side of the stripes to the other. You'll also appreciate that rather than giving you a 22 carat, 21 carat, 18 carat gold rotor or even tungsten as so many do today, the micro rotor's efficiency is optimized with the combination of ceramic bearings and a platinum mass. And again, all of this with an impressive power reserve of 55 hours. Throw it on the wrist one more time and you can see that that square profile really wears handsome and easy even on a small wrist. I can recommend this as a unisex option even though of course it did win the men's watch prize at the GPHG back in 2017. A lovely timepiece and iconic of its manufacturer, already a modern classic in my opinion. It's probably one of the two or three watches on the table tonight that I most desire for my own collection. Jason Main, by the way, the host of our Thursday show, is a big fan and he owns one. That said, sometimes folks find comfort in the mainstream, but among the mainstream, Certain models stand out, even at the ubiquitous house of Rolex, this Rolex Daytona 116508 is something else. It's almost the Hulk dial on a yellow gold cosmograph with a few well-chosen red accents on the dial. This is a model that came out in 2016 alongside an equivalent white gold blue dial model and was rarely seen, both of them scarcely requested by buyers alongside the much weight-listed and hyped steel ceramic model. In my opinion, this is the hidden gem of the Daytona catalog. Among all the Daytona models, this is the one that catches my eye most. First, although it is a little bit of a Hulk dial, it actually has a different look. I would say it almost has a somewhat glossier appearance as though it's been lacquered above the metallic sunburst. You can also see that the polishing of the golden chapter rings for the registers catches the light in explosive fashion and then inboard, not only do you have metallic green tracks for each of the registers, but you could see that the innermost 
part of the scale is actually red lacquer, creating a lovely contrast between the yellow gold, the white print, the green of the dial, and the red accents. It is an incredible watch with immense presence. You don't need a 44, 45 millimeter timepiece in order to make a statement. When you have a watch 40 millimeters with this much pizzazz, this much panache, frankly, it's a giant killer. A timepiece that you should consider as an alternative to the likes of the Hublot Big Bangs and the Audemars Piguet Royal Oaks, both in terms of mechanical refinement and aesthetic virtuosity. This is one of the most distinctive and memorable modern Rolex watches, and also one of the rarest contemporary cosmographs. And in case you're wondering, 3-day power reserve, vertical clutch, column wheel, chrono, 100 meters, water resistant. That said, it is not the rarest mainstream brand chrono on the table tonight. With an estimated 1,500 to 2,000 produced over approximately a two-year production run, the late great Speedmaster Moonwatch or Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch Tintin is probably one of the scarcest non-limited edition Omega Speedmasters of the modern age. Now this watch came out in 2013 and the word is that this was officially going to be a Tintin tie-in. So if you're familiar with the comics and you're familiar with the rocket from the comics, then you know where this design comes from. Well, the co-branding fell through at the last minute due to the owners of the copyright not wanting to go through with the deal. So Omega was left with this remarkably distinctive racing style dial that all the same betrays its influences. The timepiece is scarce and of course the case back is unique as rather than the conventional moonwatch engraving you have a combination of moonwatch engraving highlighted by red lacquer so this is a very special watch front and back it's powered by a moonwatch caliber 1861 which means it's the same lamagna based manual wind flown nasa approved moonwatch caliber on the inside the timepiece wears with impressive presence and you can see that wonderful distortion off axis of the Hesalite crystal, that plexiglass that NASA continues to spec on these watches because while it cracks and scratches easily, it is very difficult to shatter outright in zero gravity. And that's why Omega still fits Hesalite to this watch and NASA still prefers a thermoplastic in orbit. Now the timepiece is large. At about 53 millimeters from lug to lug when you include the solid end links, it wears more like a 43 or a 44, highlighting just how ahead of its time this design was back in the mid to late 1960s and a very scarce and special and memorable modern iteration of the Moonwatch. If there's any knock on the Moonwatch, it's the same knock on Rolex. Wonderful watches, but everybody has one. With the Tintin, everybody has not. Now let's jump away from the mainstream brands for a moment and talk about something that is way out there, both in terms of scarcity and complication and design and brand from a company that makes at the most about 900 watches in any given year and sometimes as few as 650. This is the 2018 F. Pigeon Vagabondage 3, the third in a series of tonneau cased watches with alternative time displays, continuing a tradition begun with the original, which was produced for the anniversary of Anticorum. This is a watch made by F. Pigeon, but you will not find the name F. Pigeon anywhere on the dial. Now, a smoked sapphire covers a center dial that betrays the solid gold base plate of the movement, as well as a jumping hour, jumping second system with a power reserve up at one o'clock. Now, you may be wondering why is it not jumping because when you get to a certain level of power reserve generally below one quarter power reserve the jump second becomes a scroll second as the remontoire de galette constant force device disengages there's not enough power to run the system but as you wind it back up and we'll wind this one right here you could see the remontoire gets back into action and with the constant force system re-engaged to maintain both chronometric precision and the jump of the second, now the watch features its jumping second complication. The first full-time jumping second wristwatch ever made. Now, as you can see, the dial has incredible depth, and that's most evident, as you can see, the components underneath the smoked sapphire, from the discs all the way down to the base plate, there is tremendous ability to look down and through this dial, as you would on the finest display case backs. And by the way, the display case back revealing a solid gold caliber. It should be noted that this is a shaped and sized caliber. As you can see, it has the unique tonneau shape. The very first Vagabondage was actually a Cartier CPCP system designed by F. Pigeon under his old 
THA, white label watch company, and it never made its way into a Cartier Tonneau watch. So what happened was it made its way into the original Vagabondage. The shape, the outline, the practice of the no-name dial, all of that continues. And this is an extraordinary watch that's remarkably compact across the wrist. As you'll find, it's just over 44 millimeters from lug to lug. It's only about 38 millimeters wide, and it's exceptionally thin at about eight and a half millimeters thick. So this is a watch that wears well on any wrist and has tremendous presence. Just like the Daytona, it doesn't need to be oversized to overload sensory perception. This is a timepiece with a huge amount of charm. And, of course, with no name on the dial, it draws the greatest admiration from those who know. Completely different tack. We're going to a much smaller brand now. We're talking about only dozens of any example of any watch made per year at Maitre du Temple. The creation of Stephen Holtzman, they put high-flying watchmakers together in collaborative efforts to create the Chapter 1, the Chapter 2, and the watch you see here, the Chapter 3. Now, this is an extraordinary version of the 2011 to present Chapter 3, the most wearable of the Maitre du Temple timepieces. This one's 41 millimeters in white gold, and as you can see from the flank, it is a one of one, only one, a piece unique. 50 millimeters lug to lug and relatively thin at 14 millimeters thick. It's a dual-time watch with a dial painted in the style of Andy Warhol's currency composition by Andre Martinez, the Spanish-born, Swiss-based miniature painter and expert in everything from hand enameling to micro-detailing. Everything you see here is freehand painted. It's not a transfer. It's not a reproduction, making this truly a one-of-one -one canvas for your wrist by one of the great modern masters who's worked for everyone that matters in the business, right up to and including Patek Philippe. Now, the timepiece is remarkable because it hides its second time zone. You could see the undulations of the paint as this was truly handcrafted and it continues underneath the dial, where you have a hand-painted roller drum for the day-night, and then down at six o'clock, you have a multicolored, hand-painted secondary time zone barrel. Now, there are two barrels. Display barrels are part of the design DNA of Maitre du Temple, which means every watch they make has those barrels. I'm going to advance forward, and you can see jumping from 12 hours to an adjacent barrel that continues the next 12 hours of the day. You could see I am looking at one in the morning because you see the one and then up at 12 o'clock you see the moon. As you continue to advance, the system continues to jump and the watch is painted by Andre Martinez, but the watchmaking and the design is by Andrea Streller, who designed this brilliant cloaked complication, and Carrie Voudelainen, who had principal input on most of the aesthetic elements of the watch, as well as the finishing of the movement. Now, let me quickly close the shutters. Note that the shutters do not just close, they also draw flush with the dial. So they move into place and then they raise themselves back up. You may wonder, what does this trigger do? It disengages the system so you can set the dial without changing that secondary time zone. Turn it all over. This is the SCH03 movement. Manual wind. You can see the barrels through the reverse side. Rich Cote de Genève, engine turned perlage on the base plate. Every screw black polished with its slot chamfered. And then I'll try to turn it to advantage and show you that there is mirrored anglage on the edge of every bridge. Let me see if I can catch that in the light. And you see it perhaps to better advantage from this angle, but there is not a single machine-finished feature on this movement. And you can see the signatures of the master, Voudelainen and Streller, on the reverse side. So an extraordinary timepiece. And since you need to see a wrist shot of this, this is a fuller figure on the wrist than the watches you've seen so far. It's a 42, but 14 millimeters thick and 50 millimeters lug to lug. So it has a very impressive presence without being overbearing. This is straddling the line between large and oversized. So this is gonna be a choice for a guy who wants independent watchmaking, but a bigger watch, but doesn't want to go quite as outrageous and ungainly as something along the lines of a Grubel 4C. Now, we have so many impressive watches on the table tonight that it is difficult to determine what the order of the narrative is going to be. But since we just saw one work by Andrea Streller, I feel like we need to continue the theme. And in that vein, I offer you the H. Moser & C. Endeavor Perpetual. 
This is a system, as with the Chapter 3, that essentially cloaks its complexity, as this is a perpetual calendar featuring a month of the year indicator that aligns a triangular pointer index with each of the 12 hour indices representing the months of the year. So you could see 6 o'clock would be June, and then the pointer is aimed at 7, which is July. You could see the date, and you could see that the Cantillon B6 teal, or the leap year indicator, is on the reverse side, so it doesn't clutter the dial. Now, you'll also appreciate that the system is not just stealthy, but note the genius of Andreas Streller, creating stealth and practicality with a perpetual calendar that you can set in both directions. You can see the month indicator is jumping in both directions, no danger to the movement, and you can't accidentally break it by setting it in an inopportune fashion. Power reserve over at 9 o'clock, rated for 7 days, it will in fact run for over 8 and almost 9. The watch is 39 millimeters in white gold, and you can see the extravagant contours of the Endeavor shape. You you can see the swell of the bezel at the ends of the case. You can appreciate the mirror-polished concave underslung lug profiles, the fact that there is a vertical satin finish on the outer face, the curved and contoured case back, and the curved and contoured cambered crystal. It's almost like molten metal was drawn out and then flash frozen in its molten form. It has a fluidity and an almost liquid lithe presence on the wrist that belies the weight of the precious metal. It's hefty on the wrist, but it's also easy to wear and lovely in its elegance elegance and understatement. The case of this watch and the simplicity of the complication, those are the charismatic features. Now, did they think of everything? Well, the other manufacturer of Schaffhausen, the other manufacturer I should mention, because IWC is the first and the largest, but these guys do things their own way, right down to the little kerf or recess underneath the crown that allows you to more easily dig your finger under the crown. The case back is gorgeous, and the finishing is all Moser's own style. As you can note, the double-crested Cote de Genève, a system that is distinctive of Moser, six position adjustment, not five like a chronometer, and then a balance beating away at 18,000 vibrations per hour with their own in-house balance, 14 karat solid gold escapement, their own overcoil hairspring, all of these small pieces made by their own subsidiary, Precision Engineering in Schaffhausen, so they even make their small parts. Appreciate that this is old school watchmaking, right down to the pivot jewels set in screw fixed chaton and the black polished screw heads. This is German Swiss watchmaking at its finest. And in that regard, I think Moser does a better I a job of articulating what German Swiss watch finish looks like than IWC, which always seems to be chasing Geneva or Valley du Jeu conventions. This is all its own and wonderful for it. That said, I don't want to underrate Geneva because Geneva, the cardinal patron city the mecca of watchmaking is well represented. Patek Philippe, F.P. Journe, Laurent Ferrier, and I should mention, Patek in a most unconventional fashion. Stainless steel, no date, and sporting. This is the Patek Philippe Calatrava Pilot New York Grand Exhibition Limited Edition. Back in 2017, in stainless steel, 42 millimeters, 600 of these were manufactured for sale exclusively in the American market. Now, if you take a look at the case back, you can see ghosted onto the case back the emblem of the Patek Grand Exhibition. It's a little bit difficult to see, but you could gauge it well from this angle. And the timepiece is extraordinary. 60 meters water resistant, twice the usual for a Calatrava. It features a simple grained blue dial with white gold applique numerals, cathedral style hands with a hybrid broadsword profile at center, and then you'll note that even the skeletonized counterweight for the seconds hand has been blued to match the blue of the dial. With no date, this is one of the rare caliber 324 Patek Philippe's you will find with three hands at center and no date. It's an easy watch to wear to just under 50 millimeters lug to lug. It's a full-sized Calatrava. Not quite a sports watch and not quite a dress watch. This is an all-the-time watch that is particularly well-suited to an 
aftermarket strap is this is a swimmable timepiece. Lovely in aviator's fashion, it could easily dress up or dress down, depending on whether you throw an alligator on there for formal occasions, or maybe even a NATO for a raffishly irreverent sports style look. Now everything is carefully considered. As you can see, there's a cross hatching stitch to the aviator style calfskin strap, and then a lovely stainless steel clevis pin buckle. Note how it's counterweighted. It's designed to look like aviator's hardware, and it does this well. A faithful reproduction of true mid-century aviation flight gear that a pilot would wear on his person, particularly for fixing of pockets. An impressive timepiece, and again, with the Patek Philippe seal guaranteed accurate to minus three plus two seconds a day. So there is something substantive about that watch that sets it apart despite the rarity and the pulchritude of the pieces. That said, some folks will only accept a Longa Unzona when fine finish is discussed. And I have to admit, I'm a Longa fanboy, and I leverage the brand highly on these shows because there's so much to love. And back in 2000, Longa, then only six years into its watchmaking experiment, because the first watches came out in 1994, they launched the Longa One Tourbillon that you see here. An extraordinary timepiece made in 250 pieces for the new millennium in rose gold. You could see that the caliper 961-1 features a black polished and skeletonized half bridge for a tourbillon that beats away at 21.6. It is a three-day manual wind power reserve and it is gorgeous. You can appreciate the tourbillon from either side of the case, but when you turn the case over, things get crazy. Did you notice the diamonds? Take a look. The capstones on either side of the tourbillon are brilliant cut diamonds. And that is probably the least objectionable use of diamonds on a man's watch you will ever find. The pusher adjuster for the date is crisp, but it also has a slick, butter-like finish to it. The initial push is crisp like a column wheel chronograph, and the finish is so refined. It's a tactile pleasure in its own right. Turn the watch over, and you get not one, but two freehand engraved half bridges, jewels set in chaton. You can see that the train, the barrels as well as the train leading to the tourbillon, set in blued screw fixed chaton, a tribute to the pocket watch era of Longa manufacture. The three-quarter bridge, a tribute to pocket watch manufacture, the German silver or the nickel copper zinc alloy that gives this movement its golden hue because of the copper, another tribute to the pocket watch era. And though we're not in Switzerland and we're certainly not in the Valley du Jeu, you could see that mirrored anglage. I need to learn the German word for that rounded hand finished mirrored chamfer that you can see on the access panel at the center, as well as the edge of the three quarter bridge and both of the half bridges for the train. Very impressive and no two alike because of the freehand engraving of the half bridges. Throw it on the wrist, it's an easy watch to wear. Classically sized, it's the Longa One 38.5 millimeters. It's just over 47 millimeters lug to lug and 9.9 millimeters thick. So if you're looking for a tourbillon and a complicated complication at that is you have the double digit date, the three day power reserve, the tourbillon and the power reserve indicator. But if you're looking for a tourbillon to wear on a smaller wrist with some discretion and taste, this is your watch right here. And we're gonna ride the longer wave for a moment because I'm a huge fan of the brand from Saxony. And it's hard to imagine that the company refounded in 1990 by Walter Longa has only been making watches in its latest iteration for parts of, but not three entire decades. So the watch that I'm holding here was a 2001 debut. This is the Saxomat powered Saxonia Longomatic Perpetual. Part of the Saxonia family, this is a white gold watch with a black galvanized sterling silver dial and a solid gold moon phase disc. Now, because it features the Saxomat caliber L922 with its zero reset second system, you can easily synchronize it to increments of time as small as a second or as large as the 122 year adjustment interval of the moon phase. Perpetual calendar, naturally, you have mono counters at three, at three o'clock, nine o'clock, and then at six o'clock. So this is an interesting timepiece because it does have a little bit of calculated asymmetry with the dropped perpetual calendar leap year phase indicator at three o'clock. And it's also very clean, intuitive, easy to read and practical, right down to the loomed alpha style hands. This is a loomed watch. Turn it all over and you can see that the Saxomat is gorgeous. Again, you have that German silver material and the three quarter style bridge, but you have a double precious metal rotor. The inner 
inner precious metal rotor is solid gold and engraved. You have those blued screws again fixing a solid platinum winding mass outboard. And then not one but two types of engine turning. Small overlap and large overlap on different parts of the movement. Throw it on the wrist. This one also is going to be 38.5 millimeters with great discretion. Also about 47 millimeters lug to lug and well under 10 millimeters thick. It's a watch that has a lot of punch. And as a timepiece that is handsomely balanced, white metal and versatile, it could go anywhere right up to the water's edge as I don't see this as an occasional watch or a dress watch, but rather a sporty casual all-arounder that just happens to have high horology bona fides and the ability to dress up right to the tux level. I know Europeans don't like to wear tuxes and watches at the same time, but here in the States we're a bit more loosey-goosey about that. I'm also going to say that, frankly, I'm a fan. Now, to stick with our recurring Geneva watch theme tonight, I'm going to show you a timepiece that we've discussed previously, but not in this form. This is the Montre École Annual Calendar, the Galais Montre École Annual Calendar, launched in 2017. Uh, the timepiece is quite simply perfect. Stainless steel, 40 millimeters, with a lovely dial that is a simply stunning array of colors, and somewhat lively and even a bit I would say light-hearted. There's a joie de vivre about the use of that cyan blue for the radial pointer date track outboard, a red varnished hand for the date, white varnished hands for the time, and then you have a lovely satin striated metallic finish. And I'll try to show it to best advantage, but you can see it is a vertical satin finish that runs on the center dial, a crosshair dial style, paying tribute to the best dress watches of the 1950s and 60s, and then that lovely montre école design designed to evoke Laurent Ferrier, brand namesake watchmaker's first school watch. Turn it all over and you can see that they are smart about design parallelism as the caliber Laurent Ferrier 126 annual calendar, which need be adjusted only once per year, is P PVD blackened and you can appreciate that gradient fade of the Cote de Genève. As I move them through the light, you can see that not only is the gradient rich and dramatic, but the Cote de Genève are laid down thick and lush, so you can easily appreciate this movement without a loop. The anglage on the edge of every bridge is so fat that you don't need optics to appreciate it, and the same can be said for the two different sizes of perlage, small and medium under the balance. Appreciate the minimalism of the watch as the double complication is both an annual calendar and a power reserve, but the 80-hour power reserve indicator is located on the reverse side. Six position adjustment with an overcoil hairspring and a 21.6 beat rate. How about that mirrored chamfer right on the edge? You can see it to best effect from this angle. Now the watch is also brilliant because it allows you to adjust the calendar system without any need for pusher tools. I can make the changes to the time or I can make changes to the date. And note that I'm able to adjust the calendar both forward and backwards with the date as well as the month without any hazard to the watch. Now curtail that activity and you can see that a pusher adjuster rather than a dimple system allows me to rapidly cycle the day of the week. Throw it on the wrist. This one is actually fairly loud and proud with straight lugs of a vintage persuasion. It has a lot of wrist presence even as I can recommend it for a wrist as small as about 13 and a half centimeters circumference. For me, the combination of the anthracite PVD of the dial and the blue of the date track is what makes this watch, gives it its character as well as its independent horology sense of its own path. This is one that takes the path less traveled, and it has made all the difference for this model. A truly special timepiece, and I cannot overemphasize stainless steel. You're not paying a precious metal premium to own the complication. Let's talk about a watch that represents the best value of any timepiece in the selection today, and that is the 2018 to present Oris Aquis Date 39.5. Now, this is a watch that has something for everyone. 39.5 millimeters, it's a nice $1,600 alternative to a Rolex Submariner, as you get essentially the same size, you get the same depth rating, you get the same ergonomics, as the watch is only 12.8 millimeters thick, and you get a better fit across the wrist, as the 46 millimeter lug to lug dimension is quite compact, and I can recommend this as a diver for a wrist as small as 13 centimeters circumference. But wait, there is more. Ceramic bezel insert 
excellent bezel ratchet action, the sunburst blue of the dial is something else, and Aura's clearly spent time on this. If you look very carefully at the edge of the date window, you can see the gloss and the gleam that betrays an application of lacquer over the basic sunburst blue dial. So you have both the sunburst metallic and then Aura's layers on a thick lacquer to create a glint, a gloss, a gleam, and a depth that a metallic sunburst by itself does not have. Turn it over on its side and you can see Aura's doing things the right way as screws fix the bracelet to the case. No spring bars here, no risk of losing your timepiece due to violence or error with a strap tool. Pop open the clasp and you can see that you get a twin trigger release system, which I consider to be upscale in this price point. I would have expected a clamshell system like Breitling fits to its watches. And there's even a dive extension built into the clasp. And again, this is a watch you can have for just over $1,600 pre-owned. So if you have that Submariner, but you don't want to bash it and you have a Royal Oak Offshore, but you don't want to beat it. This is a timepiece that doesn't force you to go quartz or go swatch, and I don't mean swatch the group, I mean swatch the watch. If you want an everyday that can take a knock and not worry your hair gray in the process. This is still a luxury watch, serviceable for life, but it doesn't force you to go slumming with a disposable product if you want a tougher, rough and tumble daily driver. Throw it on the wrist, and I gotta say the 39.5 is the size I would purchase. A couple of great options, blue dials and green. Both of them have their arguments in favor. I would say get the best condition when buying pre-owned, and as you can see, this one still has some of the original packing stickers on it. So the first owner didn't have the heart to enjoy this watch properly. Well, his loss is your gain. I hope you take this thing out into the water and dive with it as promised. Oris rating this thing for actual ISO 6425 activity. I want you to realize the potential of this watch in the real world. Some folks are never going to take a Range Rover off-road, and that's why they have an old TJ Jeep Wrangler. That watch is the TJ Jeep Wrangler Rubicon for your wrist. Now, we have some superstars on the table, but very rarely can I say we have a genuine two-of-a-kind scenario. That is exactly what I propose with two very distinct and yet inextricably linked Rolex timepieces. We have an E-Series 1990 Rolex Explorer II, and this is the five-digit reference. This is the 16570, and then we have the post-2011 216570, the 42. In many ways, these timepieces are part of the same family tree, but the person who considers the 42 is almost always looking for a bigger watch. Well, the person who targets the 40 is almost never cross-shopping the 42. Let's talk about their merits. Of course, the 40 is a very distinct watch in the way it wears because this is an older timepiece from the hollow lug, hollow end link era of Rolex, the 40 millimeter case wears true to size on the wrist and very compact. It's a world removed from the 42 and it's solid end links. Across the wrist, super simple. Just over 47 millimeters. I can recommend this watch for wrist as small as 13 centimeters circumference. And you have a look that ties the timepiece very well to the earliest generations. The early Steve McQueen's, yes, I know Steve McQueen never wore a first generation Explorer 2, but the early watches are very close in size and stance to this model right here, with this watch having the distinct advantage of authentic dual time capability. The watch is easy to wear, classic, and again, now almost 30 years old, a modern watch that you can still wear and swim with as a modern watch, but it is borderline vintage. So it is also a vintage watch and emerging collectible in its own right. So you can wear this watch as your vintage piece, your collectible piece, or your daily. It's equally adept at all three missions. That said, the 42 is a very, very different take on the Explorer. And what strikes me is not the return of the oversized orange arrow from the original Explorer 2 and it's not the 42 millimeter case, it's the matte black dial. If you look closely, the biggest aesthetic change up close with the 42 was the retirement of the old black lacquer dial in favor of a new matte black dial that is expressly designed to evoke those early Steve McQueen Explorer 2s. That old 
first generation watch is channeled quite faithfully by the dial of this timepiece, albeit on a nightmare scale. For some, 42 millimeters is gonna be a path beyond. They're just not gonna make their peace with this case. And with the solid end links, though the watch is wonderfully flat and flush to the wrist, you are still talking about 53 millimeters across the wrist. It's a watch that you should cross shop with the Royal Oak Offshore, because although it doesn't have quite the same artisanal value as the Offshore, it's gonna cost about a third as much, and it's one of the few current Rolex steel sports watches from a core professional family that is not dramatically bid beyond its retail price on secondary markets, and these are still available on relatively short notice from Rolex dealers. So you have your options when buying one of these, but I think that realistically, the ability to take delivery immediately and even get a little bit of a break on price pre-owned augurs for a pre-owned purchase, and that's certainly where I would aim if I were purchasing one of these. You do have to decide though between the white dial, which is a lovely white dial in every respect, and the black, which is truer to history. Some folks are gonna say, if you're going with the 42 these days, it has to be the Polar, because the Polar is so singular. And I think there's a lot to be said for that, but if you want the watch that's a little bit lower in profile and doesn't declare itself quite so loudly, it would be the Steve McQueen revival that we have right here. That said, Blancpain and not Rolex was the first with the first modern format dive watch, and they will always hold a special place in my heart because the Blancpain 50 Fathoms these days appeals to me more in all of its forms than the Rolex Submariner in all of its forms. Launched in 2013, the Bathyscaphe was a little bit more of a true vintage inspiration, featuring elements of late 60s and early to mid 1970s design that contrasts with the more florid and elaborated 1950s references of the standard reference 5015. And to those ends, you have straight lugs with minimal bevels. You have a satin finished rather than polished case. You have a no crown guard, big crown, design format that makes this watch a little bit more vintage evocative, even though most of the watches to which it refers are actually later than the 5015. So the timepiece here, redolent of 1970s chic, also with a dial you won't see on the 5015 in that this has an anthracite sunburst rather than a lacquer dial. The timepiece is wonderfully slender, it's just over 13 millimeters thick. This is an easy watch to wear and it's under 50 millimeters lug to lug. The timepiece is mechanically identical to the 5015, which is a 45 millimeter watch. This one's a 43, and you can see I'm wearing it easily on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. 300 meters water resistant, you get the same caliber 1315, and with the display case back, you get a silicon hairspring, so anti-magnetic, six position adjustment, 35 joules, three mainspring barrels, five day power reserve, and a free sprung balance for shock resistance. It's the full package with fat englage, a lovely and unconventional satin graining across the bridges rather than Cote de Genève. You could see that the wheels feature a spiral satin finish, and all of the screw heads are black polished. It is a truly artisanal movement in both its aesthetic and its execution, and you will not regret purchasing this watch over a closed case back 5015. On that front, Advantage Bathyscaphe. Both watches have the same movement, but the open case backs have the silicon hairspring, and they let you see that for which you've paid. Sailcloth strap, wonderfully supple against the wrist, not because of the sailcloth, but because it's backed by vulcanized rubber in every case. A very cool modern timepiece. But I'm not sure who makes the neatest sports watch on the table tonight. Last week, I wasn't able to do a wrist shot with the Vacheron Overseas World Time, and I'm happy to say today, I've got one that's properly sized for my wrist. The other one didn't have enough links. So here I wanna show you the 42.5 millimeter World Time. It is a big watch, but with the ability to trace 37 time zones, and you can see all of the individual reference cities. This is a watch that's able to keep track of 30 minute and 15 minute time zone offsets that a conventional world time watch simply cannot. Now you can see I've set New York as my reference city. The index is down at six o'clock and there's a small triangle on the bezel so you can keep track. The watch is 150 meters water resistant and significantly anti-magnetic thanks to a paramagnetic shield that runs around the movement rather than over the case back. And that is significant because this is a watch with the first generation overseas display case back. In the past, the overseas always featured a solid case back. And with a quick release lug system, the watch does come with two accessory straps as well as the bracelet, you can easily expose that caliber 2460 WT world time movement. Note the triple finished and engraved 22 karat 
Compass Rose winding mass. Geneva Hallmark finish. You could see it, the Poinçon de Genève on the half bridge for the balance. Five position adjusted like a chronometer. And check it out, every individual link of the bracelet on both sides is removable. So you can size this one precisely. And if you didn't see last week's show, take a look at the micro adjustment system that's built into the clasp. On both sides, there is a micrometric adjustment for both sides of the clasp that allows you to size without any need for removing or adding links. This is a brilliant bracelet and engineering wise, one of the finest in the industry alongside that on the new Cartier Santos. And of course, Vacheron giving you a watch that is truly swimmable, loomed, anti-magnetic, stainless steel, sporting, and most importantly, available. These sell for less used than they do new. If you wanna buy one new, you can take delivery immediately. Do I wanna pay $70,000 for any Nautilus? No, and I wouldn't recommend you do so even though I sell that $70,000 Nautilus. Get this for the win. Okay, folks, let's scale back the price and let's scale back the size. Let's go back to Geneva, home of Vacheron, Laurent Ferrier, the home of Patek Philippe and F.P. Journe. And let's talk about the giant of Geneva in a form we rarely see. This is the 2005 to 2014 Rolex Cellini Prince, a revival of a watch first launched in 1928. It is redolent of Art Deco flair, optimism, and machine age aesthetic. A timepiece that is only 44 millimeters lug to lug, under 10 millimeters thick, and delightfully only 26.5 millimeters from nine o'clock to three o'clock. Any wrist can wear it. What sets this watch apart is that it's an array of features you'll rarely encounter on a modern Rolex. First, non-oyster, non-round case. Second, a full strap. And third, a display case back. Yes, a Andrew, let's go with the display case back. Not only a display case back, but each version of the Caliber 7040 is finished to match the design of the watch. So you can see an explosive rayon radiating out from the balance bridge. Let me remove my fingerprints here because this one deserves to be viewed unencumbered by the travesties of the skin. Jumping back to the case back, a display case back, and take note, a manual wind watch, so the rotor and the winding bridge block nothing. You also appreciate that it is a thoughtfully designed movement that is properly shaped for the case. So it's chronometer certified manual wind with a 70 hour power reserve, and you could see the design parallels between the dial of this watch and the case back of this watch. And quite simply, this is one of the best values in pre-owned Rolexes. These sell for roughly half their original retail value as pre-owned watches, and I highly recommend considering this Cellini Prince. If you have any inkling of desiring something like a Giger Lecoultre Reverso or a Cartier Tank, this is a better buy. And this, in fact, is what I would buy over many Reverso models. And that's coming from a JLC fan. Let's jump back to a giant, not the giant of Geneva, but the giant of Bien, Omega. And we're rolling back the clock to the early 1970s. And this is a wonderful Omega 166081 automatic caliber, 565 inside. This is a timepiece that is literally a rounded rectangle, 39 by 39 millimeters on an 1153 bracelet with 138 end links. Let me quickly throw this one on the wrist. It's a timepiece that is all Omega as it features its original Omega bracelet and clasp, wonderfully slender at only 10.8 millimeters. How much do you love that true plexiglass? Everything about this watch is authentic from the dial to the plexi to the radio graining on the hoods of the lugs. You can see that radial finish, that deep grooved sunburst that is redolent of 1970s design. It simply reeks of its era in the best possible way. And the dial array of blue and black and white just zings me. It's aged better than a lot from its era. And you can also see we haven't polished this watch. We wanted to keep as much of the original factory metal and finish intact as possible. This is a lovely way to get into vintage at a very reasonable price. Remember, every watch on this table is available. So if you don't see it on the website, shoot an email to Brian Govberg, George Mayer, or Jason Main, my friends on the sales team who can hook you up with anything you see here. All right, we need an exit watch. They often say the exit watch is the last watch in your collection. And well, the exit watch for this episode truly is the last watch you would ever need. Launched in late 2008 for the 2009 model year, this, is the F.P. Journe Repetition Souverain.
All right. Let's take a quick look at what FP hath wrought. 40 millimeters and exquisitely in stainless steel. This is one of the few stainless steel Jorn, and it is a functional choice as the minimal density of steel allows sound to propagate optimally. You can also see that the use of blue on the dial declares this is something of a royalty, even among FP Jorn watches. Royal blue in tandem with the silver of the dial, the blue of the hands, and the silver steel of the case, which I should mention is under nine millimeters thick. Mark this as a special watch. Black polished hammer, as you can see, and of course the watch will have rolled over. No, it hasn't rolled over. I, I didn't quite get past 1259. So again, if you want to impress people with your minute repeater, set it to 1259. If you really want to impress them with your minute repeater, turn it over. See. We weren't quite done. The governor is silent, so silent that even sitting here, right next to the watch, I thought it was done because I could not hear that governor. F.P. Jorn designing the watch to be preternaturally thin and the governor preternaturally silent for a minute repeater. Two separate patents for this watch, one of which deals with the scythe-shaped gong for the watch, the other deals with miniaturizing the rack and snail system for the repeater. So not just a watch that stands out, eyes closed or eyes open, but also a watch that is subject to original watchmaking innovation and unique patents. I should also declare that this is a standard F.P. Jorn solid gold movement. It is still impressive for it. Adjusted as any F.P. Jorn chronomet souverain or chronomet bleu in six positions for chronometric performance courtesy of twin mainspring barrels in parallel, a big balance that beats way at 21.6, a free sprung architecture, and you could see the depth of this movement is exceptional. All in rose gold, all hand finish, and although this is again a brand that makes only 900 watches per year, you are only going to see a handful of these, perhaps less than a dozen per annum from F.P. Jorn, a truly special watch that disappears on the wrist. I can't think of a better way to conclude this episode. So thanks to everyone who joined in today. Remember, every watch on the table is available, whether you see it on our website or not. Sometimes I get ahead of our operations team. I want to also remind you to click the link in the description below and win that PAM 523. I want it to go to a YouTuber. Thanks to you. Thanks to my crew. Timeout, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.